Welcome to the Art of Climate Change with Elisa Singer. This event is sponsored by the UCI Student Center Board of Advisors. The University of California is nestled near the coveted coastal region of Orange County in Southern California, home to the Anteaters. UC Irvine boasts many accolades and a broad range of academic pursuits, including being voted one of the top 10 cool schools in the US for sustainability. University of California research is pioneering a path toward its goal of becoming carbon neutral by 2025 and is providing scalable solutions to help California and the world blend the curve on climate change. We're now in remote learning mode. This event is one way we can bring people together and stay connect connected while staying physically distanced. Okay. My name is Brian Pedio. I'm the marketing manager at the UCI Student Center and I'll be your host for the next hour or so as we discuss how art makes the science more accessible and science makes the art more meaningful. We'll look at how art and science together tell the story of climate change in a unique and powerful way. But before we, we, get, before we begin, let's talk about Q&A. We, we're gonna encourage you to send us your questions at any time during this event. You will not have access to audio during the event, but you can type and submit your questions. Your questions will be saved in a queue. And we've set aside some time at the end of the event to answer as many of your questions as we can. So we're going to be using interactive polls throughout this event. They're very easy to use. You'll see a question appear on your screen. Use your computer to select the answer. Please answer the polls right away as we plan to move quickly. So let's give it a try. Your first, your first poll question is, are you watching this event from the US? I'm gonna give you just a few seconds to, uh, to answer. I do see the results come in. Uh, and I'm going to end the poll and share the results. So we have the majority of people are, in fact, uh, attending this event from the US. Um, there is a percentage from outside of the US. And um, I think what's interesting about that is this really is, at the end of the day, a, a global uh, a discussion. We're, we're going to um, go on to another practice poll real quick. Uh, this is just a practice run. Answer as fast, as quickly as you can. Are you a student? Are you a student? Yes or no? And this is very interesting. So I think you'll be intrigued with the results. It's very, very even. Let's end that poll, share the results. And you can see that we're at about, uh, um, you know, it, very close, almost 50-50, 40, uh, 45, 55. Um, and I'll stop sharing that poll and we'll move right on. Um, so thank you. And let's talk about Elisa Singer. It's my great pleasure to introduce internationally recognized environmental artist, Elisa Singer. Elisa Singer is the artist and founder of Environmental Graffiti, a project which, which uses digital art created from the climate change data to help communicate the science of climate change. Her series of digital paintings the Art of Climate Change has been exhibited both nationally and internationally at museums, galleries, conferences, and other venues, and is held by dozens of universities, some of whom have large collections, as well as major science museum in Toronto. The art is also featured on the cover of the major UN 2018 report, Global Warming of 1.5 Degrees Centigrade. An exhibit of her work, work featuring 10 upsized pieces was recently installed at the UC Irvine Student Center. Her work is also featured throughout the dorms of the university's Mesa Court and at the UCI Sustainability Office. So welcome, Elisa. Thank you, Brian. I'm delighted to be here and, and uh, I'm thrilled with the, uh, the current and past interactions with the university. It's been very rewarding for me personally. So we're gonna talk about the scientific charts that inspire your art. We'll look at some of your work and take a quick peek inside your imagination and process. We'll talk about the relationship between COVID-19 and climate change and some data that will surprise a lot of people. We'll talk more about the major art installation at the UCI Student Center. And finally, we can share ways people can get involved. So let's take a look at some of your art. I have a few pieces. You have 95 in all. We're just going to take a look at a few of them. Can you tell us about your series, The Art of Climate Change? What is the climate science connection? Well, these pieces um, appear to be abstract in nature, but each of them is literally derived from 
um, either a graph, a chart, a map, or a word or number that relates to a key fact about climate science. So they are literally blueprinted and derived from the data. And we're seeing, we're seeing, we're going from art to chart. Um, so here we're seeing um, some of the science behind your inspiration. Let's take a look at Arctic sea ice extent. And so this is the actual art. And this is the inspiration behind it. And, and literally, um, if, as you can see, you can morph from one to the other because um, I, I'm very careful to not change the structure of the underlying data. I want it to be the outline and sketch for the art so that you can, so that when you look at the art, uh, the actual data can come through. Um, as you can see there, I, I, I don't uh, depart from it materially other than in the aesthetic aspects of the piece. Yeah, look at that. It's almost in a perfect alignment. And I think uh, when some people look at the artwork, they actually see a chart in, in some cases. Some people uh, look at it in a more abstract form. So it's, right. it's sure. been wonderful to get their reactions. Um, so how did you get started with this endeavor? Why climate change? What is the significance of focusing on climate change for you? Well, I was trying to find a way to combine uh, something meaningful, a meaningful and important cause with my love of art. And I was trying to figure out what aspect of climate change would lend itself to that. And I was also rather bewildered when I uh, was looking at, um, you know, charts and graphs that we all see, you know, in newspapers and uh, other articles and on the news. Uh, I found them to be very compelling and persuasive and dramatic. And I was you know, sort of shaking my head and wondering, why aren't people jumping up and down about this? You know, why isn't this information out there? It's so persuasive. And I thought, well, maybe it's charts and graphs themselves are a little off-putting to some people. Um, if you don't have a mathematical or scientific background, are you going to trouble yourself to try and analyze them? Um, maybe we need a bridge. Maybe we need a translator. And maybe art can be that vehicle to um, help to both tr translate and dramatize uh, the um, data. So how did you decide to create art from data? What aspects of the data attracted you from an artistic perspective? I think you've said you have even looked at the charts and thought they were beautiful. Well, yeah, you can see. I mean, you've created a very interesting collage slide here, uh, but you can see all the different sort of design elements that are built into the data. And I thought, the trajectories, you know, leading upwards, um, uh, the, the basic graphic elements, you have trajectories for CO2 emissions and temperature uh, leading up and you have, um, you know, Arctic and land-based ice melt, you know, heading downwards and you have everything in between. There are so many different indicators that can be the basis of a very interesting sketch um, uh, and design for art. And so, I said, I'll just go with it. I'll see what I can figure out. And I started playing around. How do you choose which arts? Are there some that just really stand out? Uh, how do you choose the ones uh, so that you? Right, good question. So I think first I have to, for me, it's, I start with the issue. What is it that I want? Uh, what issue do I want to bring out and highlight? And then I start to look around for, you know, uh, well, it's very important, the source of the data, the source of the chart or the graph, because I want to make sure in this world of climate denial and skepticism that um, I'm not accused of choosing a partisan source. So I try and focus on government agencies, U.S. Um, agencies such as NOAA, NASA, and even the EPA, um, or internationally recognized organizations such as the IPCC, which is the UN Climate Organization, or other similar gold standard brands of, of sourcing. So, and so with an unimpeachable source, I can feel more comfortable putting the information out there. And then I look for something that I feel I can render artistically because, you know, in some cases, the graphs are so beautiful themselves, I feel I have nothing to add. Um, but other times I, I, I feel, okay, I can work with this. I can try and create something interesting out of it. So this, those are my criteria. So we're looking at something called why is our climate changing? I mean, and this is part of your gallery A, 
um, on your website, environmentalgraffiti.org. Um, but my question to you is, how does the way you exhibit the art help to deliver the message? So it's, it's, the, it's the art, it's, the, it's the, the, the data and the art, but also the way they're exhibited. Yeah, very, very important because, um, well, first of all, I, I try to make, as you mentioned, I've got over 90 pieces and I try to make them very bold um, and colorful and they're usually printed. Uh, well, it, it, the, uh, your installation is an exception, but usually they're printed on metal and they are displayed with a plaque underneath. And, and on that plaque is the data source and a brief summary. So first people see bright, bold, shiny objects <laughs> to, to draw them into the room and then, which appear to be abstract um, at first blush. And then when they get well closer, they realize that it's not abstract, it's actually based on that graph or that chart. Or sometimes it's a word or number if I can't find a chart or graph that conveys the information the way I'd like it to, I will create um, a sketch using a word or number instead of lines. And so once people realize that the art is actually derived from something else, they begin um, a sort of back and forth process they will look from the art to the, the wall text, to the art to the graph, the graph to the art, and they will try and you know, find where is the um, graph, where does graph show up in this piece? And then they'll go back to the wall plaque and say, well, where, what is the meaning of that graph? What's this all about? And suddenly you have an interest in the data. There's an engagement process that wouldn't occur if you showed either of them individually. So I think that's how it helps to, um, to you know, convey the message. But art has um, you know, other aspects to it in terms of being able to deliver the message because art is inherently global and universal and um, apolitical, uh, like science. Uh, so you can, um, it brings people into the room to start the conversation. It, it bridges, um, barriers or gaps of, of uh, ideology and, um, you know, climate change crosses all borders and languages and backgrounds. So we need everybody to, to be, participate in that uh, discussion. And I think um, more people would be willing to go visit an art exhibit that would necessarily be willing to walk into an exhibit of charts and graphs. So uh, I do think it helps to, um, as a conversation starter as well. And how has your lack of a scientific background affected your work? Um, well, you would think it would be, in my view at least, it's not as much of a negative as it is a positive. Well, for one thing, I never pretend to be anything other than a citizen and a lay person. Um, I rely on the experts as we all do in every aspect of our lives. But the positive, the upside of it is, is that um, it sort of like gives me the ability to say, hey, if I can understand these things, so can you. So um, I don't think we should shrug off the, the data that's out there that helps explain and illustrate the important uh, impacts that are happening around our globe. So I think it's a, a responsibility for all of us to um, make an effort to understand this information. And I think it, it's good to know that people who don't have a background in that um, can do it just like, like everybody else can and should. Okay, with that, let's jump into a poll number three. And I wanna ask uh, attendees, are you more artist or are you more scientist? Um, what do you, how are you coming to us today? More as an artist uh, sensibility or from the scientist's perspective? So let's see. Um, okay, always interesting. I'm gonna share, I'm gonna end the poll uh, right now. I know I've given you very, if you didn't get a chance to respond that we're just moving very quickly, I'm gonna share the results. So we got a, you know, again, it's a very close 50-50 split. Uh, um, so some, you know, half science, half art. So wonderful. Um, looking at this and just thinking in general, what kinds of things can people learn from an exhibit of your work? Well, as um, I think was indicated in an earlier slide, and as we discussed, uh, the body of work has gotten so huge, and I never intended that, but every time another aspect of, of climate change, how it impacts us and, or other sources of it, you know, unfolds. I feel I evaluate, is this worthy of, a, of another image? 
So at this point, the body of, of work is over 90 pieces and it cries out for some sort of organization. So I've, if you go onto my website, you'll see that there are four galleries. Um, why is our, you know, the, the, they ask four different questions. Why is our climate changing? How is the world being affected? Who is at risk? And that's both humans and other species and what can we do about it? And the issues that I have addressed through my art are divided into those categories, which helps to create a sort of cause and effect narrative uh, to take you through the art. So in that way, the art helps to tell the climate change story. The other thing you can learn from um, visiting the art is, is the many different ways in which, um, I mean, I think people, even people who accept the basic science may not think that much about what are the different types of impacts um, I think more and more people are aware of it, you know, certainly as we've had a summer of wildfires and droughts and floods and, you know, intensity of storms and um, drought, you know, there's so many different, you know, even famine, you know, impacts on food, conflicts, there are so many different aspects of climate change that people may not think about. So if you go to an exhibit and a typical exhibit would have, you know, as, as yours does, 10 or more pieces, um, you're going to learn about various aspects of the issue from not only causation, but also impacts and also some ideas about how we can address it. So yeah. here's another example of uh, what can we do to address climate change. This comes from Gallery D uh, on your exhibit uh, from your website. You, uh, and so here it's just showing side by side. We're showing the art and the chart. Um, so now we're going to talk about how people can get involved a bit later, um, but first, Let's talk about a very special project, a, an amazing project. Um, it's your work with the United Nations. Um, I think, what was your experience like working with the UN to create this recent cover of their, of their report? Well, this was, um, as you can imagine, very exciting for me. I had um, had some interactions with uh, the United Nations. Uh, one of the scientists had reached out to me a year or so before and asked if he could use some of the art for a presentation he was making. And uh, so this, this was my second interaction with them and I was invited to submit a cover for this major report that was coming out. And this was not only a landmark report, but also the first time they ever considered using art for the cover of a, of a report from the uh, Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, which is again, as I said, the UN organization. So. I was given, as you can see, this chart, this graph. This was one of the graphs that's included in the report um, that they chose. And they asked me to see if I could turn this into art. This is, it, it it's basically shows different um, probabilities and, and pathways forward. And, you know, they then chose, they provided me this cropped version, simplified version, which is also pretty much how I create my own art. Um, I start with the actual graph, then I sort of deconstruct it and then reconstruct it as art. So they provided me with both the original figure and this um, cleaned up, uh, cropped version of it. And they also gave me some guidance about what they were looking for. Um, and if I can go back to my notes, because the words were important. Um, urgency, crossroads, and transformation. So, which was a challenge to take a graph and convert it into art that speaks to those issues. But that was uh, what they asked me to do. And so I decided to provide them with a number of different options for their consideration. There was a committee that had been formed, a committee of scientists um, that, that would be looking at the work and making the selection. So you take this concept of unity, crossroads, and transformation. You take Ur a look at this urgency. simple- Yeah, urgency, crossroads, and transformation. Oh, oh, oh urgency, right. And you come up with it, and then they give you this reduced, sort of a reduct, uh, reduced version of the, the data, and you come up with something like this. Is um, that it? This was one example. Um, I think I gave them about seven examples, but uh, that first one, if you, if you just go back to it for one second, just what, you know, they wanted to show the movement of time um, because this was very important. One of the key messages from the report is that we only have a few decades to make a big difference and to avoid catastrophic um, impacts. And so the, um, this piece 
these columns that you see are supposed to uh, represent decades of time uh, backwards and forwards. And, and again, I was just looking in different styles, not sure, knowing what would appeal to them. This was more of an abstract painterly version uh, that I uh, offered up. And this is one of two uh, that use um, a round image to infer the earth and, you know, to sort of interpose um, the art over this, this uh, feeling of the earth just as, you know, climate change has a global impact. And that's another one of these round pieces. Uh, again, you'll, you'll, one of the things, if you go back for one second to this piece, you can see the movement on the left, which is the history, and the right is the future, um, moving warmer colors to cooler colors to show the movement, the hopeful movement, um, away from the rising heat towards a, a cooler future. And something maybe, I don't know if I'm the first one noticing it, but it does sort of have this yin yang sort of <laughs> look at, you it know. Actually, <laughs> in the case, the way it's split, right. The way it's split. And so these are just, these are just um, your idea, like uh, drafts or, or some possibilities that you were offering up to, to them? Yeah, I, I gave them um, <clears throat> uh, like seven different images for them to consider. And these were the images that, that I presented. I think there might've been a few more. And this is the image that ultimately was chosen. Um, one of the things you'll notice is that the, uh, that the uh, axis um, from the graph, you know, it shows through um, as part of the design. Again, the idea of moving from warmer to cooler over time, hopeful, optimistic. Uh, the other thing that I did here is you have sort of a, a almost looks like emissions, if you will, um, in the atmosphere. And of course, carbon emissions are invisible. So this was a little bit of artistic license on my part, um, but to give that impression. And this was a piece that was ultimately chosen. And the reason uh, they also um, told me they chose that piece was because they thought, given how really dire the content of the report was, this was a piece that seemed to be hopeful. And they also <clears throat> asked me to title it. And I, um, I titled it a, a Time to Choose, which is supposed to reflect the urgency of now, as well as agency and empowerment. Um, you know, choosing signifies that we have options and that if we can find the will and courage to embrace them and move forward. And this was, as I said, the first time that the um, agency had ever used art on the cover of a report. And I think it was a reflection of their belief that art can be a powerful communication vehicle and motivator for change. How long did this process take? A few weeks, I had a deadline. <laughs> so it was, but it was, um, it, was it was, they were very, uh, it was wonder they were wonderful to work with them. And it was exciting for me because when the um, report was introduced, uh, the co-chair, uh, one of the co-chairs of the committee in, in this press conference in South Korea, um, she said, before I introduce the subject, you know, she's a throng of reporters, I want to, you know, un unveil the cover. And she says, this is the first time we ever used art on the cover. And then she showed, you know, it was just so taken aback that she would feature the cover before she even talked about the, the substance. So it was really thrilling. That just, that's just amazing to me. That must have been a, a wonderful sense of accomplishment. I mean, here your work and your mission is now being seen by a lot of people, right? And a lot of, <laughs> a lot of important people. I want to take- my, yeah, kids weren't, my kids weren't impressed until they saw that, some, that Trevor Noah used it as a backdrop for one of his uh, shows. So then all of a sudden I made it to the big time. <laughs> Okay, well, real quick, this piece behind me, this is, um, you know, I mean, you could explain it. Um, th this is climate refugees. I'm using this as a, as a virtual background. Um, uh, I don't know, you could talk about this, this, this background. Um, it's actually one of my favorites, and it's one of the biggest pieces um, in the ballroom lobby at UCI. But I'll, I mean, we'll talk about that some more, too. Um, I have poll number four, so get ready. Um, Will lockdowns from COVID-19 help the climate? Okay, and I'll, I'll repeat that. Will lockdowns from COVID-19 help the climate? <laughs> and I do see results coming in. I'm going to give you just a few more seconds. I think uh, I want to give everybody a chance to, 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 uh, to sound off here. Um, I do see the results still coming in. Um, 
And uh, this looks like a pretty good representative uh, selection. So I'm going to share these results. Okay, will lockdowns from COVID-19 help? And the majority of people, a, a vast majority are saying yes. And there are still some uh, saying no. And so I think, I think, uh, Let's, let's, let's talk about a particular uh, piece of yours. One of your, this is your most recent work. Is that right? One of the most recent, definitely. One of the most recent, okay. So what are we looking at and uh, can you just discuss this? Sure. Um, so, and I think as, as probably is reflected in the poll, people were looking for silver linings of the pandemic and it's natural to do and some people focused on the images that you saw of cities like Beijing and in LA that where the pollution and the, the, the clouds of pollution seem to have lifted. Some things that you could even see from satellite images uh, that thinking this must be really good for the climate. This is going to be really helpful. And in fact, um, for the year, it's anticipated that CO2 emissions will be down by about 8%, which is dramatic. But really in terms of um, climate change, a, a drop in the bucket. It just doesn't have any lasting impact. Um, the historical lesson here is that past economic downturns, which is what, you know, the, uh, the COVID-19 impact on climate change to some extent is economic and how it's affected the demand for oil and the, the burning of fossil fuels. So even though there were significant short-term impacts you can see each major economic event very quickly as the economy recovered, the, um, so did the emissions. And they continued to break, break records and um, you know, go to unprecedented heights. So this is not, um, it's not, history tells us this is not likely to have any lasting benefits, but, but that's not necessarily the decisions that will be made now. Um, there's some good news. In addition to the, the, the reduction in emissions, um, renewable energy was the only source of energy that didn't see um, reductions during this period. Um, basically about a one to one and a half percent increase in renewables in large part because there are, uh, uh, once the projects are completed, um, they represent a very cheap and variable source of energy because you don't have to start up a whole uh, coal plant to um, be able to use wind energy. So for, the, for, for now, um, renewables did okay, but there is a lot of reason to be concerned about the future. So there is certainly the question about whether in this is sort of a crossroads, as we talked about earlier, there's a, a, an urgency to addressing climate change in the near future. If the decision of the world is that we simply can't afford, you know, given the, the tremendous financial crisis that, that the entire planet is experiencing, that, that green energy is just not affordable, then this could be very bad uh, for our efforts to address climate change. Also with um, oil and gas at record low, it makes um, renewable energy uh, less competitive uh, than, than it would otherwise be. But there are also many reasons to believe, you know, that, and as you said, there is a political undertone there that, that will argue that we can't afford this, not now. We have to subsidize um, the infrastructure, our existing infrastructure, and go back to the way we were, and we'll have to leave climate change for another day. Uh, but not everybody views this. There is our European alliances in Europe and uh, business people across the world that are advocating uh, that the trillions of dollars that are being used for stimulus, that they be uh, you know, funneled towards uh, renewable energy and a more resilient infrastructure. And, you know, climate change and COVID have, um, you know, many similarities as well as some differences. Among the similarities is that these global shocks to the system have demonstrated the importance of, um, it was exposed some uh, vulnerabilities in our existing uh, system's ability to respond to these types of threats. And they've also shown the need for the needs and the benefits when countries uh, as well as individuals and governments uh, collaborate. And we've, we've all seen how important it was for every individual to respond to the um, requirements to, of the lockdown. So it's, 
it did, wouldn't work if we didn't get individual cooperation, but at the same time, you could see what happens if we don't have strong governmental intervention. So these are similar issues that we'll be facing in the climate change um, crisis, and hopefully some of those lessons will carry over. Um, you know, much of it remains to be seen, but I think that this is definitely a crossroads and an opportunity to either learn from the past or make the same mistakes all over again. I find this absolutely fascinating. I mean, I, you know, I want to ask the easy, obvious question, why? What, do we just, it's just, you know, it, that, and I guess that's where we, we're going to have to leave it up to some, you know, to, to the, the, those more schooled in this area and, and really, and, and just enter into, into, into this bigger conversation, um, the one that you're um, really getting us all involved with and you're doing it in a very unique way. Because if you look at this chart, I would say, oh, okay, this is um, science, this is data. I'm going to question the data because that's my style. That's my personality. Where is it coming from? Is this accurate? Um, but then we go from this chart to something a little bit unexpected. We go to this beautiful work of art, uh, an abstract. So is that how you define the art, by the way? Do you like to you know, um, talk about it as contemporary abstract? Um, and maybe a little bit about your influence. So I, I, I am somebody who loves contemporary art. Um, but I think, you know, although I, I am not a schooled artist, I'm not trained, I'm pretty useless, I'm not trained in anything, I don't have a science background, um, I don't have a trained art background, and I don't have um, the, the technology experience either for a digital artist. Um, so I would, but my understanding would be that um, this isn't classified as a, a abstract piece because it is, it appears to be abstract, and I think that's part of the um, process uh, to, to assume, make an assumption about something and then realize that you're wrong. So an abstract would be something that isn't about anything, anything tangible, whereas this is about something very tangible. And so I would say contemporary because the feeling of all the pieces is contemporary. Well, I, I think they're absolutely beautiful. Um, and we'll, we'll talk more about um, how I came to discover the art and what happened as a result. Uh, we went big. Um, but uh, we can start by talking about some of the work um, at the uh, UCI Sustainability Resource Center. Um, this was actually my, for that piece right there, um, I, I mistakenly thought that was the ozone <laughs> the very first time I looked at it. Oh, is that like the ozone yeah. or something? <laughs> so, so do you want to talk about this, uh, your, your, your work here at the Sustainability Resource Center at UC Irvine? Yes. So, uh, well, this particular piece, um, I'm not even sure which pieces I wear. They, my first interaction with UC Irvine was back in 2016, I believe, when I was approached by Melissa Falkenstein to um, provide art for the Mesa Court dorms. Um, and the idea, her idea was teachable walls, I believe, teachable buildings. And she had the, this, this concept of let's sprinkle your art throughout the dorm, through the three towers, up and down the elevators. So at that time, uh, they bought 17 pieces. And I think they also bought an, another piece for uh, another uh, conference center or office. I'm, I'm not sure exactly where the, the additional piece was. So that, for me, that was an interesting and innovative use of the art is to actually put it in us to focus uh, everybody on the idea of sustainability. And so that every time you go to the elevator, you, you're gonna see another um, reminder of, about the environment and sustainability. Well, so I work at UCI on campus and I'm not far from Mesa Court. I went on every single floor of this building and looked at every single piece of art. I wanted to see what the art looks like on metal because that's a very, unique and very it's a very it just has a wonderful luster to it and um, I wanted to see how it was displayed um, and it's in a nice prominent little lobby area on each floor um, so it's it you know it really brings uh, some awareness right to the right to the the forefront of our thinking um, and it, it was just a beautiful um, uh, way to I think put values on the walls and and um, that's exactly what we've done um, at this student center the, the Student Center is a, 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 a world-recognized uh, uh, conference center. We have lots of attention-grabbing, uh, headline-grabbing events, VIPs, um, coming through there all the time. 
And, you know, you think of our, our place as our product, right? Um, we, everything that our guests who enter the building see, hear, smell, touch, taste, really um, speak uh, uh, volumes about who we are and what we think is important. But we wanted to uh, take on this um, interior design initiative and really um, freshen things up um, and um, give it some new color and rebrand and make this a very um, UCI-centered, very student-centric um, experience for people coming in. So when I saw uh, some of your art in the UCI Sustainability Office, I was enamored. I was captivated from the start. I knew that we were going to uh, put that on our walls um, because it is who we are about. We want to join in that conversation. I think my point here is that, you know, no matter what business you're in, if, it's, if, if you're in, you know, uh, conference uh, and event services or, or uh, maybe something completely unrelated, there are always ways, if you get creative, uh, uh, to, um, to enter into that bigger um, discourse. And so this was a branding initiative and it was, an important, to, it was important to us to find something that, that uh, was really current, um, contemporary. We decided uh, to go really, really big. Uh, mm -hmm. you know, we installed 10 supersized images, each accompanied by a placard. Uh, and I'll talk about how we use the placards um, with QR codes to link to, uh, to websites for more detail. Um, I'll go to a, 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 a slide showing some of the installation. And do you wanna, do you have any thoughts about the UC Irvine exhibit? Well, sure. I, I, first of all, I'm very sad to say that I was not able yet to visit it. We're all on some sort of uh, restrictions on travel. So, but as you said, these are supersized. These pieces, are three times the size of, of what I call my standard size exhibit works. And this was, a, I thought, a bold, visionary move on your part, Brian. I, I had always been curious to see what it would be like. I always thought that they would have tremendous impact if they were printed much larger, but um, there was never a venue or a call for it. And the fact that you, you undertook a risk here because I've never printed that large and I didn't know if it would work. Um, and so <laughs> I'm thrilled to see that the quality seems not to have been compromised. And I think that the impact is tremendous, and especially in that large space. So very bold, innovative. And then the QR code approach to, you know, makes it obviously brings it, this into the future. Uh, I've never used anything like that before. So I think that the whole approach of the exhibit also using canvas instead of metal was another um, unprecedented move on, on your part. And I just thought that it, it seems like it's worked out great and I can't wait to see it. I can tell you that uh, working with you has been wonderful. You are as exuberant and proactive as you are creative and thoughtful. It, it's been, it, this was a, a source of real joy for everyone on this team. But yeah, we were exploring and pioneering some pretty new territory here, right? Because we didn't know if we could scale up from these smaller sizes, which are uh, originally uh, all digital art, right? And so we were trying to scale up from these original um, sizes, 300%, and um, also, uh, you know, kind of give it that wrapped canvas look. These actually are, are lightweight and very easy to maneuver, but it took a special printing process. It was, right, so we had to work with some, some really great vendors uh, mm -hmm. that you introduced us to, and to make this happen. We had, and even shipping became uh, a part of the logistics and then actually hanging them up on the wall and getting them straight and, you know, and, and then, and all those simple, obvious things. But it, uh, it all came together in the end. Right now, with the campus in remote learning mode, nobody can see them. Uh, they're just in this, this grand, vast space, uh, space in, the, uh, uh, in the student center in the Pacific Ballroom lobby. Um, it's, it's colorful, it's bold, it's beautiful. People who, the few people who have already seen them uh, stop and take notice. And I think still uh, more really take a look at the inspiration behind them. So it's, I think they're, they're effective. They're, they're making people stop and take notice. And so I think it really services your mission which we can talk about with environmental graffiti uh, uh, and environmentalgraffiti.org. And it also serves our purpose to really freshen up the student center. And again, uh, put, our, put our values into the student center brand. 
Um, so uh, I think we have, uh, I mean, you can see here up in the top, top left, just, uh, uh, you know, unpacking and, and trying to move these in. At one point, Elisa, we, we weren't even sure if they would fit through the door. That's not something that I had considered during there's all this early planning and, and everything. So yeah, uh, there was a moment where I was kind of sweating it out a little bit. Um, but uh, thank, <laughs> thankfully, these pieces did fit through our, our, our pretty big sized doors too. And I'd never, never worked with those printers before. So I never had to use extra large printing. So the whole thing was, you know, edge of the seat kind of tension to see if it would mm -hmm. actually work. Yeah. Um, but it was a really, it was really one of those projects that brought the team together too, you know, uh, and, and from maintenance and just from excitement um, and, and, and bringing things, like I said, a little more current. In the, and here's some, some nice shots of just people uh, walking by uh, and noticing the art. Um, uh, and um, you're right, it was bold. Uh, we, we've always been very careful um, about what we put on the wall. So, so these are actually quite low to the ground. So you can get up and close and personal and you can really see them. Um, you can touch them. Uh, we, you know, <laughs> we don't want you to, but that's <laughs> my point is, you know, you can really get up and up close and personal and it's just been wonderful. Uh, these QR codes, um, they're very colorful. So most QR codes are not, uh, but uh, th these ones we wanted to give it some color and make it kind of match the, uh, the, uh, the color of the art. I don't know if you would want to talk about that too. Your color choices are fascinating and that's what, that's what drew me. It was the aesthetic for the science. You know, finding this, this. Uh, di what are your thoughts on your color choices? So, it was sort of back and forth. I, I, I'm a little split because, well, for one thing, I typically do go for highly saturated color because again, I'm trying to draw people into the room. I'm really looking for bold and uh, you know, gorgeous, rich colors. Um, but I try not to. I, I don't want to provide a, um, a hint of what this piece is all about. So there, there are exceptions. There are definitely exceptions where um, it's pretty clear that this is about water, you know, or this is about fire. Uh, but I, I like to have a, the, the color be purely an aesthetic choice. And since, because I, um, I, I my process is more like happy accidents, um, I really just, you know, play around until I see a color that I like. I try not to question, does it relate to the message? Because I'd rather that it didn't. I prefer the, you know, the, the distance and the, there's greater surprise when you look at something and it looks like um, a bunch of, of uh, uh, it was you know, I forget the, you know, the, uh, the term for the pipe, the, the chimneys from you know, uh, an industrial site. Um, and instead it's, it's actually about food. And you know, so I, I wanted there to be a more of a disconnect, and I think that the surprise creates more impact. So I try not to choose colors based on the underlying message, but sometimes it works out that way anyhow. Well, they certainly are beautiful. Um, let's uh, let's talk about how people can uh, get involved. Um, what would you like to say to anyone interested in becoming active in addressing climate change? And then what we're going to do is after this, we're going to move right into the Q and A. So. What would you like to say to anyone interested in becoming active in addressing climate change? Well, you know, as we know, there are many, many wonderful organizations, um, which I am not in a position to list and there's no need for me to because they're readily available and we all know what they are, but I think go onto their sites, find out how what kind of volunteering they would appreciate, you know, what, what their needs are. Obviously they all need money. Um, but I would say two other things. Um, if you really want a long-term commitment to this issue, uh, figure out what your passion is and try and find a creative way to involve what you love to do uh, with this cause, which is what I was able to do because I've been doing this now since the end of 2014. And I don't think I would have had the commitment to stick with it if it didn't involve something that I've loved my whole life, which is art. So I found a way to combine what, what I really love to do with something that I really care about. So that's kind of a dream. And I would try and encourage everybody to be creative in figuring out the way in which you can make a contribution to this issue on a long-term basis. Um, 
And really, I can't stress enough how important it is to vote <laughs> because these are problems that require leaders at all political levels, local, state, federal, international. We need political leaders that are committed to take bold action. And there's only so much we as individuals can do. Uh, so it's terribly important to, to vote is what I would say. And then in terms of the um, environmental graffiti collection itself, what I'd like to make people know, anybody who is out there who is a, involved in an organization or is a professor or scientist uh, that is interested in acquiring art uh, for a professional purpose, everything I offer, whether it's for a school or another organization is without any um, profit. So I simply pass through my own costs. And if you are looking to acquire art as an individual, there's a, there's a slight markup to help subsidize some of my other costs. But everything that I do, I do with the intention of getting the word out, getting the message out. And I'm not trying to make any money here. So it's an extremely affordable collection of work. And sometimes I will work with um, people to create art uh, from their own data. Um, I've done that a number of times. And so if you're a, a scientist, or a professor who's done some research and like to, to turn it into art, um, feel free to let me know. And of course, I'm not going to charge you anything other than whatever out of pocket costs I have. Well, that sounds wonderful. Wonderful message. And I want to say we're going to the Q&A section now. So please send us your questions. Uh, type them into your computers, click submit, and we'll get to them uh, uh, right away. So um, before we do that, one final poll. Um, overall, how satisfied were you with today's event? So very satisfied, somewhat satisfied, somewhat unsatisfied, or not at all satisfied. Um, and we'll close this poll very shortly. I'll share the, um, <laughs> uh, I can share the results with you, <laughs> but um, uh, hopefully they're good. Um, and then we'll go right into the Q&A, okay? So it looks like all the answers are in. I'm gonna share the, share the results. It looks like most people were we're either very or somewhat satisfied with today's event. So we're very happy about that. This was just our way of connecting with people while we're staying physically apart and trying to reach out in these new, using these new, you know, not new, but current uh, technologies and ways. So uh, for more information, please vi visit environmentalgraffiti.org and view all the 90 plus pieces and several uh, gallery exhibits um, that Elisa has. Um, you'll learn the science, you'll love the art, and you'll find ways that you can get involved. So um, I'm going to, let's, let's go to some of the questions. Um, and uh, go ahead and you can, there's still time to submit uh, questions. Let me see. Okay. And I think you've already answered this. Um, would you be willing to take on commissioned art right now? Um, is, would you, is that true? You know, are you, did you work with certain people only or is it scientists primarily or, or also universities? Oh, sure. Um, either. Um, anybody who has a credible source of, of data that they're interested in uh, translating into art, I'd be delighted to work with them. Okay. And uh, so how many pieces do you have? Well, I, I say I have over 90, but I have to say that there is, um, uh, some of them are duplicates and that's sort of interesting because I had to, they're not duplicate works of art, but they're um, updated um, versions. Having started this about five years ago, there's been a number of cases where in just that short time period, uh, the facts have changed so dramatically that I felt the need to redo the piece. For example, sea level rise um, is a piece that um, a very similar graph looked markedly different five years later in terms of projected uh, worst case scenarios. And I thought it was important enough to do that again. Um, CO2 emissions, something called the Keeling curve is one, it's a, it's a well-known graph um, of people who study climate science and it shows over time how CO2 emissions have increased. And despite all the conversations about climate change over the last five years, they've just continued to go up. 
So I felt it was important to redo that piece as well. So there are probably about three or four of those pieces that were the same subject, just updated. Um, and then, you know, the rest is just constantly seeing different issues to, you know, explore. Okay, so um, this is not a question, um, but uh, let's uh, thank you, Heather, for this uh, uh, compliment. As a social ecology major, I love this idea. So creative and a great way to teach science. So thank you, Heather, for that. Uh, for that. Uh, now, uh, Randy is asking, may I ask how many attendees were here today? I don't know the number. I have, <laughs> I can't tell you uh, right now. Maybe I'll be able to uh, or, or, or pull that up a, a little bit later. I hope to uh, be able to tell you before we end this uh, broadcast today. Um, I've been, I've been uh, pitching some, uh, uh, tossing some softballs, Elisa. Here's a, here's a hardball question. Uh, how do you feel about us dropping out of the Paris Accords? That's a pretty easy one. <laughs> <laughs> okay. um, I mean, I, I, you know, I think it's devastating. And the other problem is that, you know, another, yet another um, impact of COVID-19 and climate change is uh, this year's uh, summit in Copenhagen, I think it was supposed to be, um, had to be delayed a year. And this was a very important year, every year that goes by. Um, we've gone from world leader to um, world denier of, I think we are um, possibly the only country at this point who is not in that accord. And having been, you know, responsible for creating it, it's just sad and ironic and tragic. I, I want to make a, a correction here. It was um, uh, Heather was asking how many attendees are here. It was uh, uh, Randy uh, who was asking um, about the uh, about the Paris Accord. So I wanted to get that right. And thank you for their questions and for their for their comments. Um, and I I I think with uh, I think we uh, I'll. We have already answered, um, what is your process for creating a piece? How long does it take? That's a good question. So now, on average, is, is there, how long does it take when you, from inspiration or, or to completion? Uh, assuming that I'm able to focus on it, um, you know, for, uh, for you know, a few days, I would say, a few days to a week, it depends. Um, sometimes it comes quickly, sometimes it's slower. I would say a few days to a week. Uh, this question is from Randy. Are you optimistic about mankind's ability to deal with climate change? Hmm. <laughs> um, I think that, that we will address it at some point, but I do fear that it will be too late to avoid some of the more cat catastrophic impacts. That's sad and cynical, I think, but that's, uh, that's an honest answer. Well, thank you for that. It's been a wonderful, it's been a wonderful hour with you, Elisa. I really love the art uh, and I think many, many, many people will. Like I said, in, visit environmentalgraffiti.org, uh, learn the science, love the art, um, see how we go from chart to art and open and let's start talking about this stuff. Um, uh, any final thoughts, Elisa? before we sign off? Um, I guess we're all just so steeped in the combination of um, events that has overtaken our world. And I just hope that we all remember that even though climate change isn't as um, dramatic short term, you know, how quickly the pandemic has come on us, uh, it's, it's slow, it's inexorable, it's uh, becoming more rapid uh, it's inevitable and it's devastating. And I just hope that we um, don't, you know, don't focus too much on the immediate urgent issues that we're facing uh, now to the exclusion of this, what could be an even greater and more, um, uh, you know, uh, damaging uh, experience, you know, across the world. So that, that just, uh, just kind of keep your eye on it. All right. Thank you, Alisa. Thank you, so Thank you very much uh, for joining us in this virtual world of ours. And uh, 
Uh, thank you everybody uh, for tuning in and for your questions. Uh, I hope you've learned something. And with that, I'm going to say thank you and um, enjoy the art and goodbye. Goodbye, thank you.